now, Lord, may the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in the middle of a series called Then They Talk Together. And we're looking at the power of our conversations, how, how our conversations have the power to change the world we live in. Big claims, but I've spent two weeks now trying to back up those big claims. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's, it's uh, beginning to sink in a little bit. Now, um, here we are. We're talking about the power of our conversations to change the world we live in talking about how great it or how significant it is when those who have the honor and respect and, and love for the Lord, how, and that awe, how when they get together and talk that the Lord sees this, we pulled that right out of Malachi, written right there for us all to read, that the Lord sees and hears, and he takes notice of that. And even when there's things happening in, in our lives or in the world that we don't understand, that uh, when we talk together, significant things occur. Uh, we said that we move not in the direction of our great ideas, but in the direction of our words. And last week, we looked at, uh, from Colossians, how that word, the words that we speak of God, the, that God talk, shouldn't be something that we wear on the outside like fancy church clothes, but that really has a home on the inside and resides deep in our hearts. And all of that sounds really good, but we have a problem. And the problem is Monday is coming. This all sounds really good on a Sunday. Um, uh, really great, yeah, God talk and good conversations. And Chris, that was, kind of, that was kind of funny with your whole church clothes story and all that. I know, thank you very much. Uh, but Monday is coming. Monday is coming and my kids are going to go in, out into the world where there are perspectives shared with them and things presented to them that don't have God at the center that, uh, that uh, views expressed where it's very clear that, that these views don't believe that God loves the world so much that he sent his one and only son just for them. That's great, this God talk, but what is that good in this scenario? Uh, Monday is coming and I'm headed into work and my colleagues have situations that are just heartbreaking and I find myself saying what everybody else says. I'm so sorry if there's anything I can do. And we just feel like they're just words. What do I do? And sometimes I get asked questions that I don't know the answers to. Like, if God is so good, how could this happen? That's a tough one to answer. Have you ever been asked that question? If God is so good, how does this, how does this horrible thing, how did he, why did he let this happen? Um, what do I do in that situation on Monday morning? Because Monday is always coming. And I also have family members and friends and neighbors who do not know the hope that is in Jesus Christ, that God loves them. And how the fact that God loves them is actually life-changing. And they don't know this. So what good is all this God talk? It's real nice that you're saying all these things. But what good is that on Monday? How do my conversations have any real impact on the life that's happening outside of these doors during this one hour or two hours if you stay for coffee on Sunday morning. Um, what good is all this God talk when it feels like it's just gonna be a one-way conversation? And I'm not even sure what to say because I'm not even sure it really makes any difference. Have you ever had one-way conversations? Like you're talking and you're not getting any response back? I had this a couple times recently, actually, where I, I just, I'm being friendly, right? I'm just working out at the gym and, and talking to people afterwards. I'm just talking like, hey, yeah, that was great. You know, you're, that particular thing you were doing, that was awesome. And no response. I don't mean a little response. I mean, no response. And you're just kind of standing there like, mm, okay. And you just keep walking. Um, that awkward silence. Um, or sometimes, do you ever feel like you're talking and what you're saying is going in one ear and out the other? Hello, moms. In one ear, out the other. Um, it just, like, it doesn't matter. Let me first, before we look at the text for this morning, let me first just make a, a statement that I hope 
stirs up your faith this morning, Jesus really is the answer. Do you know that song from, I think it was the 70s, my parents say, Jesus is the answer. Do you, have you heard that one before? Oh, that was like, that was probably, my parents were, my dad in particular was a hippie, and the Jesus movement was really, and this song really came up out of the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. And the song, it sounds like an old, the old like Pepsi or Coca-Cola commercials. What was it? What the, if, I, if I bought the world a Coke, the pet, is it Pepsi? Yeah, if I bought the world, it's that kind of vibe. And it's Jesus is the answer for the world today. You just imagine them locked arms singing, above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. It was just like anthem for this particular uh, movement of Christians back in those days. There's something so simplistic to the song uh, and to that idea, Jesus is the answer. It's like, you know, when I have all the kids up here. If I ask any one question, if they say the answer is Jesus, nine times out of 10, they're probably right. Uh, Jesus is always the safest answer to give to, in any Christian scenario, right? It's Jesus, it's Jesus, that's right, that's right, it's Jesus. No, Jesus really is the answer. And I don't mean that in a simplistic way. It's a very simple answer, but I think we're probably all old enough to realize that sometimes the most simple answers are the most correct ones, the most true ones, and often the most powerful things in our lives. Um, why, does, why, does, uh, why is mom always doing this for me and doing that? And well, she loves you. Ah, that's simple, but is there anything more? No, she loves you. Uh, why is, is, am I going through, or what can I do in the midst of this situation? Uh, what, uh, you know, this family, this, this, uh, Chris Sigler died at 35, cancer. He had like four months be between diagnosis and death. What do you do with that? How do you process that? How do you answer these kind of questions? I'm telling you that at the core of all these questions that we're asking and the process of asking them are, is Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. In that situation, it's not maybe not the answer that you're looking for like, oh, God did this because this and this. Um, I, those are, I, can I just advise you not to try to give simple answers like that, kind of cliche answers like that? But Jesus is always the answer at the bottom. And you can say that every time. I don't know. I don't know why this happened. But I know Jesus says, cast all your cares on the Lord. That he sees when a single sparrow falls from the sky, your pain is not lost on him. Your questions are not lost on him. And the comfort that comes in those kind of situations, I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer every single time. I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about them finding their way through this life and becoming adults who haven't left their faith or who are strong in their faith. Or I'm worried that they won't, that, that, uh, uh, about them coming back to faith. My coworkers uh, ask, uh, are, are in tough and complicated life situations and they have tough and complicated questions. Jesus is the answer. My family and my friends, they have a hurtful past, a painful present or a difficult future. I'm telling you this morning that Jesus is still the answer. He really is the answer for every need, every problem, every, every question, circumstance. And the greatest gift that you and I could ever bring to another human being is the reality that Jesus is the answer, that he's spoken to every need in our hearts, that he himself is the person that we need in all these situations. What, what does the word gospel mean? Do you know this? Gospel means good news. It's good news. And what is this good news? This is good news about Jesus Christ. And it's not just good news for religious people. And again, remember last week we made a distinction between uh, outward religion and inward faith. Do you know often the good news about Jesus is bad news for the religious? It's bad news for a religious kind of mentality, a, a mentality that says what I do it, or, or that my um, faith is determined on what I do alone. Jesus comes and, and and we are not presented with that, uh, this idea that God helps those who help themselves or who, who work hard enough and all of that. No, we're presented with Jesus, who is the greatest gift that you and I could ever not work for or earn, but receive. Jesus really is the answer. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good he is. 
and all the good that he's promised to us if we only put our trust, not in ourselves, but in him. And you know, I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that in the church today in general, I'm not just speaking here specifically, I'm saying I've been here in New England for a little over a year now, and I'm concerned that we have lost sight of the fact that Jesus really is the answer that we need, that he himself is the person that we need, that all of the things that we could offer, they're all great and beautiful, and we should offer and, 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 and be in service to all mankind, just as we read in the responsive reading, Jesus who knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Yes, that's our Jesus, but he himself is the greatest answer to all of our, to everything that we all need. The greatest gift that we could ever give them is this story of who Jesus is, that he's come because God loves us. And you know what? It would be awesome if every time you and I said that to somebody, they believed it immediately. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be just awesome to know, hey, you know what? I'm going to pray for you. And that person to be like, yes, thank you. Wouldn't that be something special? That, wow. Yeah. But often the conversations are one-sided, or at least we're afraid of them being one-sided. And we feel like they're going through one ear and out the other. Well, these are the problems that you and I tend to have. And guess what? Jesus is the answer to these specific problems as well. In Mark chapter four, uh, Jesus tells this story about a man who went to go plant some seeds. Um, let me, uh, well, I've got it here on the screen. Let me read it for you. He says, uh, listen, Jesus says, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns came up and choked it and didn't produce fruit. Still other seed fell on good ground and it grew up producing, a, producing fruit that increased 30, 60 and 100 times. So he tells this story and then later with his disciples, he explains exactly what he means, uh, what this story was intended to tell. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. Some are like the word sown on the path. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them. And others are like seeds sown on the rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They are short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Others are like seeds sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but the worries of this age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And those like seeds sown on good ground hear the word, welcome it, and, and produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 times what was sown. I want to point out three things to you this morning when it comes to these one-sided conversations, when we just feel like it's us speaking and we're getting blank stares or nothing back, or I find often, more often, we're actually afraid of that happening, and that happens actually less than what we're afraid of. Uh, but in the event, you know, one-sided conversations or that people just aren't, they don't understand when I say, you know what, I'm praying about this, or I, I, I you know, that, that's a tough situation. I want to, can, I'm going to pray for you about this, or, or um, uh, you know, my faith has really helped me get through this in a particular situation. You know, one-sided what should we know about these things? Here's the thing that we learned from this story from Jesus. Every heart is a battleground. Every heart is a battleground. You know, you look at that and you think, oh, it's just a field and he's sowing. No, there are things that actively work to take the good seed away, to keep it from growing, to keep it from becoming what it was intended to become, uh, namely something that produces a harvest of some kind, some kind of fruit. Um, our, our, every heart of ours is a battleground, and every heart that you speak to, there's a battle. It, their hearts are a battleground. Well, the three enemies that we see here is Satan. He comes and plucks it away. I know that might sound strange, but um, I, the scriptures teach very clearly that there is a whole metaphysical, if you will, a spiritual battle that happens. Uh, Paul says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. 
It's a, there's a spiritual thing happens beneath what we can see with our eyes. And Satan is an active force. He'll come and pluck it away because the last thing he wants is for you to find peace and rest and wholeness in God. He doesn't want that. That would mean God wins and he doesn't want that. So Satan comes and plucks it away. Hard times come and burn it away. That's the seed that fell on the path and it started growing, but it just had no root. So it scorched, uh, burned up quickly. Or like the seeds sown among the thorns, worry and selfish ambition come and choke the very life of it away. Every heart is a battleground. This is important for us to know when we're standing in the world and we're looking at all these things, we feel like the conversations are one-sided. Every heart is a battleground. Second of all, the power is in the seed and not in the sower. There's such a relief in this. And if I could, if I could do, if, if, if when we think about having these one-sided conversations where we're just like representing our faith in some way, if we could just be relieved of the burden, it is not on the burden of the sower to make the seed grow. It is not on the burden. Uh, it is not your burden to make this, that the words that you say would have any effect whatsoever. That burden's not on you. That burden's not on you. It can't, the, the quality to produce a harvest that, you know, 30x, 60x, 100 times what was sown, that quality is not in the sower, it's in the seed. You know, in every, in every acorn is the potential for a, a, an oak forest. In that one little seed, it's, it's the seed that has the power, not the sower. You know, the thing about when you plant, if you just think about it, Sowing seeds, it's such a tiny little thing every time. And yet that tiny little thing, I just, I'm planting strawberries. I'm trying to grow strawberries from seed uh, right now. Those things are tiny. I mean, they'll, if, a, if a stiff breeze comes, the seeds are gone. They're so tiny. They're growing right now, thank God. But once they grow, how many more uh, strawberries do they produce that have many more seeds within them? This, this is just... It doesn't make sense mathematically. One plus one should not equal, you know, a thousand. Uh, it, does, it shouldn't work that way. This is, this is why, what is so beautiful about Jesus' imagery and his, the purpose of him choosing this idea that our words are like seeds. They sow seeds. It's beautiful and because the power is in the seed. And what is this seed? It's the word of Christ that should dwell in us richly, like we talked about last week. It's the, the word that we speak of when those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. It's the word of this good news of the gospel that is alive inside of us and comes out. It is, it is a beautiful, powerful thing. Isaiah 55, this is like the go-to verse for understanding how uh, this word of Christ is in itself powerful. God, God says through the prophet Isaiah, for just as rain and snow fall from heaven, and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. His word does his work. The power is in the seed, not in the sower. And here's the last thing. So every heart is a battleground. The power is in the seed, not in the sower. And third of all, the sower sows. The sower sows. It doesn't get much simpler than that. The sower isn't trying to determine which hearts are good soil and which hearts aren't. The sower sows. The sower isn't trying to determine who is ready and who's not. No, the sower sows. The sower isn't letting fear consume his heart or her heart with thoughts of a negative reaction. No, the sower sows. The sower can't control the outcome. The sower can't make the seed grow. Guess what? The sower sows. Powerful and so freeing when we understand this. You know, at, oftentimes when we think about sharing our faith, the word evangelism comes to mind. And depending on where you came from and what tradition you've grown up in, and we have all kinds of church traditions represented here, that word can feel like, yes, let's go do it. 
I've only known a few people in my life who are like that, by the way. Yes. Give me a street corner somewhere. You know, give me a big sign that I can wear. Yes. Um, I think for a lot of people, the word evangelism is like, uh, anyone else have a bit of that reaction? Like, mm, no, no, thanks. I'm good. I'll, 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 I'll come to church. Maybe I'll invite friends to church. But yeah. So we think about sharing our faith in that kind of idea. But you know what? Every one of you, every one of us who has received that beautiful story of who Jesus is and who, who have put our faith and trust and hope in him and him alone, we carry the seeds of that message with us everywhere we go. And guess what? The sower sows. That's it. The sower just sows. I, this was a hard, at work, you know, at the water cooler. I don't know if we have water coolers at work anymore, but at the water cooler. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It, how was your weekend? Uh, it was good, you know? I, I was at church, and we've got this really good-looking new pastor, and we really like him. And <laughs> he's just wonderful. Oh, I'm just kidding. But I, I, I sang a song on Sunday, and the words of the song just, wow, they were just really great, and they really just encouraged my faith. The sower sows. I uh, am going through this hard time, but you know what? I've just found that when I pray about it, I just, I, it, I, like, I feel trust in God in my heart. The sower sows. You're having a hard time. Man, I'm so sorry this has happened to you. Can I pray for you? The sower sows. It's not on you to do anything else with the seed. It's not on any of us to do anything else. You do not have the power to win the world but the sower sows. This is the way, if I'm, I am 100% convinced, if I could be more than 100% convinced, I would say that, but I'm 100% convinced that if we took this mentality to our faith and, and brought that mentality to bear on the world around us, wow, we would begin to see in real time that Jesus really is still the answer. So, Today, I want you to consider this. And I just want to say a few things to specific people. First and foremost, I want to say something to moms. There is only so much that you can do. And I think we're probably, we've all gotten to the stage where we, we realize that. There's only so much you can do. It's like, you know, just talking with uh, Becky this morning. I celebrated the one year birthday of my twin nieces yesterday. And it just goes by so fast. A year ago, I was telling you that it was iffy and we weren't sure that one or both of the, the girls would make it. And yesterday was their one year birthday. It goes by so fast. It's like one day you're holding them. The next day you're putting their backpack on and they're shipping them off to school. And then one day I haven't had this yet, but one day I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in their rear view mirror as they're driving off to start their adult life. Like... I am not looking forward to that day. You, you're not going to want to see me on that day. I guarantee you. There's only so much that you and I can do. And so I find myself thinking, so what can I do now? What can I do now? What can I do to, to get them on the right foot, to encourage them, to set them on the right path and to, to do all these things? And, and we think sometimes it gets into worry. But we can only do so much. And I'm convinced, moms, that the best thing that we can give to our children, the best thing, that will, something that will bear fruit in their lives 30 times and 60 times and 100 times what you've sown is the faith to know that no matter what, God loves them. And Jesus died on the cross for them. And we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If they know that, they know enough. They know enough. Dads, friends, colleagues, neighbors, brothers, sisters, daughters, sons, you will not always have all the answers. You will hear stories that are heartbreaking, problems that are complicated. You will come across people in your everyday lives that need to know that God loves them, that Jesus is the answer they need. What do we do? The sower sows. Every heart is a battleground. Don't worry about your abilities or lack of them. The power is in the seed, not in the sower. And remember, the sower sows. Let's pray. God, thank you 
that the, the power is not in our hands. Sometimes that's frustrating. Sometimes we wish it was that we could say the right words and would get the reaction that we desire. But Lord, often it feels like it's one way and possibly even that our words aren't even landing. Thank you, God, for the freedom that comes from realizing that the power is not in us, but in the seed, in the word of Christ, in the gospel itself. Thank you, Lord, that all that, that is ours to do is just to sow, and you will take care of the harvest. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.